In today's video, I've chosen to first review 4G63 parts groups before we get our hands dirty. So I'm going to use this whiteboard to explain what all these parts groups are. If you're ordering parts for your rebuild and you're paying attention, you'll find that they're broken down into groups and then further into subsections. Each one of the sections focuses on a specific need for your build. For this part of the series, we're going to do the cooking by the book. For instance, parts group 11 is the engine block, section 090 is just the overhaul gasket set. It's all the things that go in between the stuff. It's one part number that you can use to ensure that you're getting all of the gaskets and seals packaged together. Because the build for my GSX consists of the best pieces of both the 6 bolt and the 7 bolt platforms, no cookie cutter factory kit is ever going to suffice for me. But for everyone else, this is a really good place to start. Here you get two options. You either get to buy the complete engine overhaul gasket set or just the upper set, which I've referred to here as the head set. If you've mixed up generations of parts like I have, you're better off buying the complete kit for the block you have and also the head kit for the head you have. That might give you a spare head gasket and lots of other stuff that you don't need, but you'll have everything that you do need once it counts and maybe a gift left over for some other needy DSMer. These gasket sets are cheaper than buying them all individually, so you're better off not trying to piece one together on your own. You'll leave out tons of stuff that you should be replacing while you're in there. I'm one of those weirdos who does know what I need, so I put my own set together. Essentially, the bottom half of my engine is a 6 bolt, which means that everything below the head gasket, like the block, is pre-1992 and a half stuff. The pistons, the wrist pins, and everything else above the head gasket are all 7 bolt second generation stuff. However, most of my parts on either side of the head gasket are aftermarket anyway. Some of it's factory, and much of the factory stuff has been modified. Some of that factory stuff is even missing. So even though there are some hybrid gasket sets available through some vendors, much of it still wouldn't apply to me. I'm just that much of a rebel, I guess. If you look around, you'll find shops that sell mixed gasket sets because of people like me, but for everyone else, there's the complete and the upper sets of all three major revisions of the 4G63 and the DSM platform. Know what parts you have and when they were made, and you'll get everything you need from the right engine overhaul set, saving yourself a ton of time and effort. I'm not responsible for part number revisions made that are newer than my documentation. I know some of this has changed over the years. I've caught a lot of that here, but further changes are only inevitable, and I'm going to give you the specs and every bit of info that I can to help you figure it out or to make substitutions on your own. Because we're talking about section 11090 being an all-inclusive engine gasket set, there they are, I've got all my gaskets hanging right there on the pegboard, ready to go. It's everything I need, plus a few extra examples of factory gaskets that I'm not even going to use, they're just for examples. We'll dip into those as needed, and as we go through later sections of the parts catalog, putting these things to use. For right now, it's just an organized place to put them all. Section 11100 is liquid gasket sealant. Yes, that's all there is to this entire parts group section. It's just a tube. Which number on the tube do you need? Well, if you're building an engine, the part number is MD997110. If you're building a manual transmission, the part number is MD997740. If you're building an automatic transmission, the part number is MD974421. I am building an engine today, so the correct answer is this stuff. You'll notice the part numbers changed. All of the part numbers in this section have changed, in fact, but all of these part numbers are still cross-reference out correctly when you're searching for it, so you'll just have to do your homework and know that and be prepared for it when you open the packages. Use the proper sealant for the thing that you're building because the lubricants they contain will break down the wrong stuff and cause it to leak. So if you want to pass section 11100 in flying colors, just be sure to get the right sealant to start off with. It's what you want to use and something that you should order close to assembly time because it doesn't shelf forever. You'll get the best results from a fresh tube. Section 11110 is the rocker cover assembly. You saw me messing around with that thing in my last video. Everyone seems to modify this stuff, but for those that don't, you know that rubber doesn't last forever. This is all easy stuff to replace to keep your car's crankcase ventilation system sealed up, including the fasteners. So if you see oil on the outside of your engine, this is the parts group to take care of all of that. You should start here. Differences for production dates are all noted. 
When you last saw my valve cover, I was finalizing a modification that made half of it irrelevant for me. I have a coil-on plug system so that I don't have the plug well cover. I changed out my valve cover fasteners for blingy stainless ARP cap screws. I've got a blingy billet screw-on oil cap with an O-ring on it, so I don't need any of this. There's also no breather intake port on the side, so no other clip, no other hose, no other vacuum hose connection from that port to the intake snorkel. My engine no longer has a working PCV system. The valve cover's blocked off with a quarter inch NPT plug where the PCV valve used to be. So there's no valve, no clamp, no hose, and no connection to the intake manifold to pull vacuum. I'm using that port on the manifold for other things now. Those two ports were a little under a quarter inch each. I'm putting three times the factory boost pressure through this engine than it was engineered for. So naturally it's gonna make more blow by. Now I have a pair of 3 8 inch inner diameter breather ports and my breather setup gives me three times the capacity that the old pair of quarter inch ports used to offer. Under boost, a stock DSM has only one quarter inch inner diameter breather port, so technically with my modifications using a pair of 3 8 inch ID holes, I have more than six times the breather capacity under boost now. I think that's gonna be sufficient for how I'm using this build. I'm likely gonna make some more changes in that department, but the bulk of this section is, it really got remedied in the last video. The breather mod I was fixing deleted the factory breather lines so that this diagram doesn't even really apply anymore. The only thing that applies to my car in this parts group is the valve cover gasket. That's pretty much it. I didn't even use the stock rubber half moon seal. I used the aluminum one from the Evo. We skipped 11120 for now because it's the cylinder head and we're not ready for what's left to do on that yet. I've already done a lot of work on the cylinder head in earlier videos. So now we'll move on to 11130 cylinder block. The oil squirters are one of the first things that you're supposed to install on the block. They get harder and harder to reach as you install other things, so we'll start there. If you replaced your oil squirters and bought new ones, then they include the locating spring pins. If you damaged or lost the pins, you can order them separately using this part number. I bought new ones, so mine are included. The part numbers for the oil squirters change dependent upon whether you have a 6 bolt or a 7 bolt block. In addition to the four squirters, you need eight gaskets. These are the bread in the oil squirter sandwich. They're just aluminum crush washers. With these three parts stacked, they're then secured with check valves, which are basically banjo bolts with the valve inside of them. They're expensive. I like using new ones. It's only the turbo blocks that have these parts, and the 2G stuff is all completely different. This covers the 1G oil squirters from 89 to 94. Most of you are probably going to reuse your dipstick, but in the event that it gets lost or broken, there's your part numbers. I went with a 1G dipstick tube and the 2G dipstick. It doesn't matter what year 4G63 you have, they all work. Just be aware that when you order these parts that the tube does not come with the O-ring gasket that seals it into the block. It's just an O-ring. Next up is the engine rear main seal housing. There's five parts that make this thing up. Technically, nine parts if you count all the bolts individually, but there's a retaining ring that shields the rear seal. It has to be oriented a specific way, and we'll cover that soon enough. Next, we have the rear main crankshaft seal. Following that, we have the rear main seal gasket that seals the housing to the block, and of course, the housing itself. The housing is secured to the block using five M6 bolts. There's also a pair of dowel pins for alignment, but they're referenced in the block section we're about to get to next. Speaking of the block section, there's two Phillips head plugs which I'm sure are going to be JIS screws that seal up the crankcase. These two holes in the crankcase are the aftermath from drilling out oil galleries into the balance shaft bearing journals during manufacturing. If they're missing, you're going to make a mess. There's also a plug located on the back of the block for a hole that you use to align the rear balance shaft when you're doing a timing belt job. Whether or not you have the shaft, you need the plug more than you need an oil fire in your engine bay. So make sure you have this thing. There's sealant pre-applied to this bolt from the factory. More with the plugs. This is the main oil gallery plug. It's 3 8 inch BSPT, which stands for British Standard Pipe Taper. It's a tapered thread whenever there's a T on the end. It's a rare thread in the United States, so whether you need the tap or the plug, plan accordingly. Now we're moving on to the dowel pins. There's four sets of these things in the diagram, and they're all critical to your engine and transmission's longevity. Let's start with the ones for the front case. On the bottom corners of the front of the block, there are two dowel pins that align the front case. They're 11 millimeters in diameter and nine millimeters long. They're hollow because a bolt also goes through them. Next, we have the cylinder head dowel pins. 
These two dowel pins go at opposite corners of the cylinder head deck to keep everything dead center with the cylinder head. If you left these things out, you'll figure it out as soon as you're replacing the head gasket. They're 16 millimeters in diameter and 12.9 millimeters long. MS4471111 has a uh, one more one. There you go. The third set of dowel pins keep the transmission bell housing aligned. I've talked in other videos about how critical these things are due to DSMs not having a pilot bearing in the middle of the flywheel. Don't reuse these things. They rust and they degrade. They take a lot of abuse because DSMs make a lot of torque. These are some of the most crucial components with regard to your clutch's engagement. They're 14 millimeters outer diameter and 19.3 millimeters long. Last pair are the rear main seal housing pins. These keep the crank seal centered on the crankshaft so that it doesn't wear unevenly or leak. These rarely go bad or require replacement, but jerks like me powder coat things and get them contaminated and don't feel like cleaning them, so there's the part number and what they look like. They're 6 millimeters in diameter and just shy of 14 millimeters long. I changed my shirt so that I can call these freeze plugs. On a 6 bolt, we've got it easy. One part number produces perfect results for all nine freeze plug holes. They're all the same size. We don't have to chase down different sizes. Nope. That's everyone else's problems. Most people insist on using brass freeze plugs because they don't corrode. I would have done that if brass didn't clash with everything else that I've done in my engine bay. I'm using the standard steel ones and I'm okay with that. I'm just gonna fill in some deets here for your benefit because I know some of you are gonna take screenshots of these. They're probably gonna end up everywhere. Might as well list the quantities too. If it's not marked, the answer's probably one quantity, but use common sense in case I screw anything up. Where it gets weird is the balance shaft bearings. There's an option for standard bearings and there's one for oversized. If you had a balance shaft bearing failure and you went through the painstaking trouble of removing a seized balance shaft and repairing it, then you line board the journals and now they're oversized. This is when you would need the oversized bearing. Though I don't understand why anyone would go through that time, trouble, and expense, that's what's not the weird part. The weird part is when you try to figure out that an engine that sits in a transverse mounted position in the engine bay actually has a right and left hand. This confuses a lot of people, but essentially the timing side of the block is its face, making its right hand the front balance shaft or the one that's closest to the radiator. It has a front race and a rear race. There is no front race for the left hand shaft, so the rear race is either right hand or left hand. Don't confuse RR for right rear. That's not it. Another way to tell which one you're looking at, the left hand rear race has no oil hole in it because it's oiled through the shaft. The right hand shaft, or the front balance shaft, is oiled from the block, so both of those journals do have oil holes. Just take your time here, look at everything, you'll be fine. The hard part is ordering the right parts when you don't know what all this means. Let's not forget the engine mount stud while we're in here. There's its part number and it's an M10 by 40 millimeter. I said in the last video that I'm not replacing it, mine's in perfect shape. I'd do more damage removing and reinstalling it. If you don't know how to do that, just double nut it. If it's stubborn, tap it with a hammer and then try again. I've showed it before. There's the whole 11130 section completed. I added the part numbers whether you're a 6 bolt or a 7 bolt 1G DSM. I also added standard bearing sizes to the whiteboard for 6 bolt first generation DSMs. This is your screenshot moment. Cheese! You got it? All right, let's do some work. I'm gonna start with the freeze plugs and balance shaft bearings. No sense in beating on this thing later after I've installed stuff into it. This is the fun part because we get to use a hammer. I'm using the Stinger kit. Everyone else who's used it quickly realizes the only valuable parts in it are the dies that fit your freeze plugs. But I'll put the whole thing together anyway to show you why I say that. All that matters is how the dies only press against the outer edges of your plugs to ensure that they seat perfectly flush against the block. I'm using Indian head gasket shellac, just like everyone else. It's got some interesting properties. It'll stick permanently to anything smooth, so be careful with it. But the best thing about it beyond its reputation is how it's cheap, you click, and it just shows up at your house. The poof applicator built into it is a disaster unless you take your time to drain the poof, shape it properly, load it up, and then apply it. If you take the time to do that, you'll find that it's the best applicator you could ever use for this. If you don't, it's easy to make a mess and do a terrible job. I figured out the poof right after this hole. It really doesn't take much. It's such a tight fit. The shellac gets spread out so thin, and as long as you brought the right size plug for the hole, the shellac is actually extra. 
but perfection isn't a standard, so it's a good practice to use it. What matters most is that you drive the plug in perfectly straight, and that's precisely what this stick thing does not help you do. These rods are only good for driving in that 50 cent core plug in a packed engine bay that you don't feel like pulling apart. With this driver, another set of hands, and a pry bar, you can really work some miracles. But other than those specific circumstances, it's really useless. Everyone else that has easy access to the hole and more important things to do gets a 27 millimeter socket and regains control of how straight and how fast they're driving in the plug. You'll be here all day with the stick and it doesn't have to be as complicated as this thing can make it. Stack a socket on the die and drive that sucker in. If you're pounding a freeze plug in with the socket behind the lip without the die, then you risk distorting or seating it out of round. The die prevents that by pressing on a portion of the plug that never makes it past the lip, and as long as there's nothing wrong with your casting, then you can't seat the plug crooked with this tool. You'll get it perfect every time. Once the shellac cures, it stands up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 148.889 degrees Celsius for the Fahrenheiters. That's a good bit beyond the threshold of what coolant ever sees, so it's perfect for this. If you're carefully trying not to make a mess, then you're cleaning off the die after each time that you drive in a plug, so that excess sealant doesn't get smeared all over the next plug before you even start. That's why I put the goo on the inside outer edge of the hole instead of on the plug. It'll smear in there and seal just the same either way, but without all the unnecessary leakage. Look, stop it. I'm being totally serious. This is good advice if you're building a show motor that has expensive coatings on it. The left-hand side of the block has four core plug holes to fill. Three of them are gravy, but the AC bracketry accommodations kind of get in the way of using the one that fits the 35mm plug driver the best. The little bolt hole stand thingy gets in the way, so I'm going to have to let this one here go for now and we'll move on to the end first. There you go. You see how flush that is? This last hole, I mean, there's ways I could fix this. One is by permanently altering the die with an angle grinder and hacking a chunk out of it. I took a gamble with the next size smaller die. Even carefully terrible, I got it half a millimeter too deep all the way around. <sighs> Proving that with every attention to detail that I can't duplicate how flush and perfect the right tool works. Freeze plugs or core plugs are all friction seated. They're bigger than the hole and they're basically held in by spring pressure from compression. A crooked plug is the one that you'll have problems with first. You can absolutely drive in a freeze plug with a socket and some skills. Absolutely, yes, you can do that, but getting them as perfect as the freeze plug driver always does the first time, every time, just isn't likely to occur no matter how careful you are. The right hand side is like production work. Three plugs and it's very clean and straightforward. I'm going to clean up my mess with some denatured alcohol while the goo is still tacky. I didn't do all these coatings just to destroy them. It didn't take much, just dampen the rag really. They all cleaned up beautifully. Putting the goo in the hole is what made this part of it so neat. Moving on to the balance shaft bearing installation. Now there's two ways that you can do this. One is with the balance shafts and one is without. So today we're building an engine without. I have an absolutely brutal video where I drive the bearings into this block with the balance shafts that came out of it. I had no intentions of ever putting them back in. That was a demonstration of how to do this without the right tools. This time I've got the actual Mitsubishi balance shaft bearing driver specialty tool that's listed in the service manual. I bought my OEM tools used and dirty. I don't know how else you're going to find them these days. They've been out of production for many years. If you have old factory assembly tools, be sure to keep them oiled. They're just bare tool steel with a light patina on them so they will rust. There are lots of creative threads on DSM tuners showing home-built solutions for this tool, and they're both creative and effective. I know that I'm extremely fortunate to have these tools, and I don't take them for granted. But the driver can't do all three bearings all by itself. The left shaft requires a plate that bolts to the front of the block. That's a plate that I also have. It's needed for the left shaft, whether you're installing or removing that bearing. With this plate and the driver, you gain the ability to drive in all three bearings. But what about removing them? I also have the factory balance shaft bearing puller, which we'll use someday when I get to the Gallant. There's just absolutely no way that you're ever going to be able to read this. I'm still trying to figure out this camera's behaviors, and I'm still making mistakes with it. To remove the left bearing, you also have to use this tool along with that plate. Both the driver and the puller fit it, and the plate is only used on the left-hand shaft. I only need the driver today, but I cleaned all these things up for the sake of this topic. If you're deleting balance shafts, dirty methods work. If you want to service a balance shaft correctly or delete them in a reversible and reusable way, then these are the tools that you're going to need. 
I'm getting the calipers out. The bearings are 44 millimeters outer diameter for the rear race and 45 millimeters diameter for the front race. Be aware that both of the right shaft bearings have oil holes on them. They have to be oriented a specific way in the journal whether you have balance shafts or not. Aside from the fact that I already don't have the left shaft bearing, with a balance shaft delete you don't even need to mess with the left shaft bearing at all. That bearing has no oil hole and it doesn't hurt anyone just to leave it in there forever and never mess with it. I mean I suppose you could remove it for weight reduction maybe. I'm using the same factory bearing and blocking off the oil supply holes on the right shaft by rotating their orientation 180 degrees in the bore. So look in there and verify the orientation of your bearings so that they're facing precisely where you need them for whatever configuration your build requires. You saw me clean this thing relentlessly prior to moving it in here, but before you install any bearing, the step you need to do immediately before it goes in is to clean the bearing journal. I'm using denatured alcohol and a shop towel this time. Yes, I know they produce lint, and so do coffee filters. Using either one, I still blow it out with compressed air afterwards to clear out the lint. So with all these parts and tools spotlessly clean, you start with the inner bearing. This tool isn't supposed to fit the bearing tightly, and it's not supposed to rattle either. The lip on the bottom is the bearing driver surface. If it weren't spotlessly clean, I would never rotate this dry like this because you could scratch it, but I want to show you how it fits on the tool. If it fits tightly, something's wrong and you're going to mar the bearing surface when you drive it in. If it's loose, you've got the wrong bearing, check your part. The inner bearing is a millimeter smaller so that you can fit the driver into the block and service it. You can't service the inner bearing if the outer race is still installed because the tool won't fit it. The factory service manual says to oil it before you drive it in, and that's good advice. I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to shut up and let you listen to the sound of the bearing seating at the proper depth. That last hammer blow will sound the same every time if you keep wailing on it. But in your hands and in your ears, you'll know exactly when to stop. And there you have it, installed in perfect depth and alignment, bearing hole rotated to block off the oil supply to the missing balance shaft. You also use the same tool for the front race, but it works a little bit differently. You unscrew the rear bearing driver boss, and now the front bearing fits over it. You get it lined up, noting the oil hole location, tap it lightly a few times to get it started, and then pound it home. When you get to the end, you get that familiar clang. One extra just because. Even if you can't feel what I get to feel, you get to hear the sound of satisfaction. I'm really happy that my compressor waited those few extra seconds to cut off. Next up we have the engine bay fire suppression plug. Since I don't have to align a ballast shaft ever, that's all this is for me. And I figure that I might as well put it in now and get it over with. You saw it comes preloaded with a thread sealant. There's no torque spec for this bolt, you just grab a 14 millimeter wrench and honk it down hand tight. For most of the dowel pins, I'm going to wait until I'm bolting on the components that they align. However, I'm going to go ahead and seat these dowel pins for the front case so that I can show you something else. It's really easy to do, you just need a flange bolt that's 20 millimeters long. All you need is a few extra threads to reach the inner M8 hole that's behind this dowel pin boss, and the head will pull the dowel pin in and seat it as you tighten the bolt. The dowel pins should not be able to fit into the hole loosely. At least I won't have to look for these things when it's time to install the front case. But the real reason I'm putting these on right now is to finish showing you the balance shaft tools. The dowel pins are instrumental in centering the locating plate for the driver and puller for the left shaft. The way this works, the distance from the outside of this plate to the beginning of the left hand rear bearing race is now the same exact depth as the outside of the block to the right hand rear race on the other side. So what these tools do perfectly on the right hand bearing will also work here. Just no oil hole to ever have to worry about on the bearing because it doesn't have one. The rear race bearings are both the same diameter, so you can use the same puller and driver on either side. You fold the puller's leg down to get it through the bores, 
kick that foot out, hook it against the outer edges of the bearing race, and then tighten the nut down to peacefully pull and evict them from their journals. But that's it for show and tell. Since the rear main seal housing is in pieces right now, let's go ahead and get it ready to bolt down. Meet MD998376-01. It's the Mitsubishi crankshaft seal driver made by OTC. In the service manual, it has a handle on it. Except that it shouldn't. That drawing's wrong. There's no way to attach this to a handle without something protruding from the bottom of it, and you need to be able to work with this thing flat on the workbench. But the way the seal driver works is kind of like how the bearing driver works. You put the seal on the driver, center the driver over the part, you start off gradually tapping and then work your way around. Then after it starts evenly, you beat that sucker down all the way around until it stops. When it sounds and feels the same for a full circle of hammer blows, check to make sure that it's perfectly seated and then I guarantee you you'll still be able to fit a feeler gauge around the inside edge of this case. This driver is a couple thousandths of an inch thicker than the seal, so it can't drive the seal deep enough to crush it. If you have a flat workbench and you use this tool, you'll install it at a perfect depth every time. The seal retainer has a hole on the bottom of it that you align with the bottom of the rear main seal housing. The flat side is the bottom of the housing, and it lines up on the oil pan flange. You don't need a special tool for this, you can just use your fingers. Flip it over and press it on the flat workbench if it's being stubborn. With that popped in, it's assembled and ready to go. But the block's not ready to receive it yet. Remember that I got a few more things to do here and a couple of dowel pins to replace. But before we get headlong into that, the main oil gallery plug seems simple enough to take care of first because I already have the wrench, the socket, and the plug. But there's no torque specification anywhere in the service manual for it. Not that I can find. I looked around online and I found a stat for a 3 8 inch BSPT carbon steel plug at 48 foot-pounds. But mine is zinc coated. I found BSPT pipe listed at 40 pounds. I found zinc coated fittings that required 3 quarter to 1 and 3 quarter turns from finger tight. But this plug has thread locker on it and that will have a major impact on how far it finger tights. The highest torque rating I can find for anything 3 8 inch BSPT in the 2G service manual is a block coolant fitting at 33 foot pounds. Not a steel plug. So I set my wrench to 33 foot pounds and I'll keep going and watch it if it feels right, if it feels like I should. It should be pretty close to that though. So there's a half, there's a full turn, there's one and a half, two, I can feel it touching down, two and a half, starting to get good. Oops, jerk the wrench, false positive, coming back up. So 35 pounds it is, that felt good. That turns from finger tight, spec was nowhere close, it was nearly twice that. But that looks awesome and it's at least as deep as the one I remember stripping out. Thanks to that thread locker, you'll have to use fire before you remove these or you'll destroy things. You didn't see me chase the mains in the last video. I made some stupid claim because of a parts mix up on my shelves that was completely inaccurate. I said that DSMs had 11mm main studs, but I guess what I really meant to say was that I had put my used 2G head studs into an old 6 bolt ARP main box and I measured the wrong parts from the wrong box when I did my voiceover. They are indeed M10 by 125 millimeter threads. All 4G63 mains are M10. Another thing that I lied to you about is using this solvent around my coatings. Look at me. And is that a paper towel? Jaffer, you said you'd never bring that into the clean room. Well, to salvage this coating with this solvent, this has to be all about rapid absorption. And nothing beats the quicker picker upper. Sorry on all counts. Really though, I can't avoid using this right here. Nothing is going to strip and prepare bolt holes and bearing surfaces that are oiled as well as this is going to do it. So you'll see me doing everything necessary to minimize its impact and to prevent damaging these coatings. What I'm doing is slow filling each bolt hole to top off the threads with a solvent to thin out all the goo. I'm inserting a stud, wrapping it in a paper towel, holding that firmly against the block and threading the stud in to push the cleaner goo slurry up past the threads and into the towel. Basically the stud is a hand threaded pump. This stud shoves all the solvent from the inside out, washing the entire length of the threads. You'll see the color of the spunk on those white towels briefly. Sorry it's not very easy to see because I have to catch all of the solvent in the towels or else it will immediately strip the finish. Since you're not supposed to lubricate the inner threads of the engine block when you use studs, perhaps this cleaning method would help those mechanics who are insistent about installing head studs one at a time while the head's still on the block. 
The solvent might damage gaskets, sure, but it's a lot better than blowing head gaskets because the studs keep backing out. I'm going through this level of detail because I wish to illustrate that assembling an engine is just a process whether you follow it or not. I changed the process pretty drastically with the laundry list of modifications that I've chosen to make, but that should never make anyone ignore the original process. Because I'm putting an early first generation engine into an early second generation chassis, there'd be segments or even whole videos where I have to flip from 1G to 2G part numbers. My configuration would be very specific to my goals. Modified or not, Mitsubishi never put a second generation car together this way. I've had to do most of what you're witnessing for the same car once before. I promised to bring it back better than it was when I broke it, and since I broke it in 2011, really it's a complete do-over from end to end right now. It's a little bit difficult to clean much of anything on this side of the engine block when 90% of what you need to clean and chase is obstructed by an engine stand. So I'm using this time to detail this side while we do all the dowel pins. Obviously there's powder coating on them. Sadly it baked onto the joint between those parts and it didn't take me long to end up making it look like this. I don't want to break it off. We'll do the other side first. There's a hole in the back, but it's powder coated on one side and glip tolled on the other. I had to use heat and cold to break it loose just so that I could get the penetrating oil deep enough in there to get them out. It'll be hard to spot, but after I heated up the pin, I shot it with an upside down can of air to freeze it. This temperature shock seemed to do the trick, but it didn't work for the other plug which gave me an indescribable kind of fit that even required getting my feet involved. I felt that one in my left shoulder for a couple days afterwards. Good times. But there you go, with those out of the way, a gasket goes here, so clean it with a razor blade. I also used solvents here because I got sloppy when I painted it. It doesn't pain you to be too careful here. This is not an area where you ever want to have leaks. It's serviceable, but it's an extremely difficult seal to service once it's all back together. Once I was happy with the edges of the rear main oil seal and bell housing flanges, I decided to go ahead and replace the dowel pins for the transmission. It's always easier with penetrating oil, and the way I get the oil in there is to insert a punch or a socket extension inside the pin and force it laterally all the way around the sides to loosen it up. The oil creeps into the gaps and makes it easier to unseat. It can be really difficult to get these things out, but they do come out. If I felt like hunting down an M8 bolt that was the right length for it and cleaning it on my bench grinder, then I'd be using the same exact trick I showed you earlier on the front case pins to press these in. But my hammer is right here and I don't need to clean it, I just tap them in there softly and repeatedly. The dowel pins are tapered on both ends and that makes it easy enough to get them started. I did pretty much the same thing for the rear main seal housing pins. I used a punch. I did this because it helped me hold them straighter in the hole as I drove them in. You've got to appreciate how these next 16 parts come in 13 different plastic bags with staples in them. Watch out for those things. Make sure they don't land anywhere you don't want them. Clean your 17mm socket thoroughly until it's dirt free. You should be doing that with all of your tools anyway now, and you should also change your gloves often from here on out too. Of course, I'm not wearing gloves at all right now. See, there I go doing it again, doing one thing and saying another. The check valves are spring-loaded, so your oil system has to overcome some resistance in order to get them to squirt. They don't do a whole lot at warm idle, and the oil jets are tiny, so they don't really do a whole lot when they're wide open either. They're actually not for lubrication, as many have proven. They're more for piston cooling than anything else, but they do offer other benefits. You place the washers on this assembly with the sharp edges facing out. These crush washers have sharp edges on one side and they're slightly curved on the other because they're punched out of a sheet of aluminum. The sharp edges go out and the curved edges face towards the oil jet. Once you've got it all stacked up, go ahead and install it. But first I'm going to clean up the oil jet flanges again, one last time before they go in. Put the oil jet assembly in the hole and snug it all the way down hand tight, ensuring that you keep the jets flush against the block with the spring pins aligned inside their locating holes. Do that with the other three jets as well. 
Oil squirters also aid compression by producing excess oil on the cylinder walls, increasing oil shedding in an effort to reduce combustion blow-by. If it's effective, then that would also actually improve oil quality. It's debatable as to whether or not they're even necessary, and many have proven they're not because there's lots of NA blocks out there making huge boosted power without oil squirters. Even the non-turbo pistons can take a ton of abuse as the Hyundai's proven. If your rods have a hole drilled through the, the rod in one side of the big end aiming at the wrist pin, just like the factory rods do, then it fires a shot of oil twice per engine revolution at the wrist pin. But my rods that I'm installing in the GSX do not have the oil holes for the pistons and the wrist pins like the factory ones and some other aftermarket rods do, and I want those cooling benefits. There's only one illustration with torque specs for these things in the entire service manual. There's not one sentence or illustration beyond the parts group sections and the torque diagram ever uttered about them anywhere in Mitsubishi's documentation. So grab your torque wrench and torque them all down between 22 to 25 foot-pounds, just like that one tiny drawing says to do. That's all you get. You know there's something different about 7-bolt oil squirters, and I don't know what it is, but they have a different part number. But I have a feeling that you all are about to let me know what that is. I know the part number, I gave it to you, but anyway, there's not really very much more I can show you from this parts group section, because we've installed it all. And we're approaching 40 minutes now. All I've got left are some main bearings and a pair of dowel pins to install for the head surface. But we're not even going to mess with the head for a little while, so... Well, let's do the bearings. This is just so steampunk that it's beautiful. New parts to install, so new pair of gloves. Now, mains. Main journals. If that doesn't summarize in two words the importance and how central this part of an engine is between you and you getting it right, then I don't know what would. Because if you lose sight of that, main can just become another four-letter word. The easiest thing to get wrong is the cleaning, and that's really a shame because it's the easiest and most mindless thing to do. It's a process, and if you get this wrong, you're a victim of your own impatience or poor vision. If there's a fleck of dust, hair, skin, oil, or anything else between these journals and the bearings, then it will permanently change how the new bearing seats and wears over its lifetime. The reliability and longevity of the main bearing starts and ends with the cleaning. Even an oil film layer on the journal has a thickness that will change the oil clearance on the other side of the bearing. So this is not a matter of OCD. This has nothing to do with retention or being a perfectionist. It's the bare minimum requirement for any mechanic that's trying to do this kind of work. I'll say it again. Main journal. This is my main journal. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It aligns all the forces of physics that give purpose to every single other part that I bolt into my block. If I'm not aiming for perfection here at the bare minimum, then I should be paying someone else to do this work to begin with. It's your attention to detail ultimately here that can make or break everything else that you do in an assembly. Big shout out to Sergei Alexovich for the suggestion to trial nitrile gloves. I really enjoyed that. Nitrile gloves do indeed work for the final cleaning. They're great at exposing if the surface is clean enough for assembly or not. They wiped away lint that snagged into or between things that high pressure air wouldn't remove. I used the blue glove method beyond my normal cleaning routine and it showed me some spots on the bearings and journals where my cleaning wasn't adequate enough along the way. Dirt or oil of any kind show up on nitrile rubber. So that advice came in really handy for me here. I didn't clean with the nitrile gloves necessarily, but I did follow up my cleaning process with them afterwards, and they easily removed all remaining traces of it and told me if I was done. Yes sir, static free and no lint. The technique I'm using to put these things in is called rolling the bearings. They're actually designed for this. They're not perfectly round, but in circumstances where there's a part still in here, you can roll them out around the part from one side and roll the new bearings in. That doesn't make it a roller bearing though. These are oiled journal bearings. When there's no part here, sure, you can just press them into the journals. But if there's anything on that journal that can cause a problem, any, any defect, then doing it that way doesn't let you catch it. Rolling the bearings into place will allow you to catch debris or imperfections in the journal so you can deal with it appropriately and correct it. It will scrape off any foreign material that's loose, but it would snag on anything that's stuck, protruding, or damaged. 
perhaps it's simply superstition. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's why I do it, but anyway, that's how I do it. You'll notice there's a tang on one end of the bearing. Start on the other end. You use two fingers to pull it across the face, and once it stops, use two fingers to press it the rest of the way in. If there's a problem, then the bearing stops. If you can't massage it into place and get past that, then remove the bearing, find out why, clean both pieces again, and do it over until it works. You want to seat the bearings flush against the mating surfaces of the mains once you're finished. I'm not torquing anything down in this video. I've got test fitting of some aftermarket parts and dry assemblies to do first, lots of procedures to check to make sure that I'm doing this right, and they need to be in their own video, really. There are multiple stages you have to go through if you want to blueprint what you've got, and, and you bet I'll be doing all those steps. Those steps are both preparation and assembly, so we're going to have a really good time going forward. This block is ready to receive a rotating assembly if it fits. Thank my sponsors. That's an order, not a statement. They motivate me to do this for all of your benefits. They're the generous ones, not me. Hit the like button if you learned something. Hit that subscribe button if you want more. Ring the bell if you want to be notified when the next video drops. We covered a lot of parts groups today and there will be plenty more to come. So until next time, stay tubed.